Hello, everyone. I'm Christos Xenofondos, Assistant Director for Administrative Services at the Rhode Island DOT and Chair of ASHA's Committee on Performance Based Management. Uh, welcome to the quarterly joint meeting of the ASHTO Committee on Performance Based Management and the American Association of State Highway and Transportation Officials uh, TPM uh, Technical Service Program. Thank you all for being here today and for participation on today's webinar. We really appreciate um, the fact that you are here and that you are, uh, you know, volunteering, um, you know, to our ASHTO committees, because as you know, um, ASHTO is a volunteer-based organization, and what we put in it is a, it's really what we end up getting back at the end of the day. So we have many folks to thank as we begin our webinar, webinar today, and please allow me to recognize our vice chair, uh, Jean Wallace, and our secretary, Karen Miller and our entire Committee on Performance-Based Management leadership team with their volunteer work to keep the Committee on Performance-Based Management on top of everything that is happening and ensuring that it meets uh, both yours and your agency needs. Also, many thanks to FEDA Highway, especially Ms. Smith-Jackson for their partnership with ASHTO, uh, the committee and the entire performance management community. A huge thank you to Anna McLaughlin and the entire ASHTO team for supporting the committee and for all of the work to keep us going. A special thanks to our featured topic speakers of today, um, speakers today. Our quarterly web calls aim to share ASHTO and Committee on Performance-Based Management information and updates with the members, the stakeholders, and our partners. Before we begin, note that links to the notes and slides from today's web call will be posted on the TPM Pool Fund web portal at TPM dash portal.com after today's um, you, you know, webinar. We would ask that you please mute yourself during the meeting to avoid any distractions. We have reserved time for discussion today and entering your information in the chat will help us organize that conversation. You will be able to unmute yourself or raise your hand later on if you wish to speak. We have a great program planned for today. And with that, let's dive into our agenda and review the agenda. Next slide, please. So a feature topic for today is policies in action. I think a lot of you have seen lately the NPRMs that they can, that have come out of Federal Highway um, and how the Committee on Performance-Based Management has been working to react to that. Policy is critically important for all of us. It really drives uh, decision-making, but policy also drives investments and it drives results. So um, before we, um, you know, jumped into the, um, you know, feature topic, we can first kind of hear from Anna McLaughlin um, on the ASHTO updates and from Mish on the Federal Highway updates. Following that, the chair of the uh, subcommittee on policy and rulemaking, um, Ryan Huff, will present on our feature topic. He'll cover why good policies matter, various state policy case studies, pending rulemaking, and provide other work group um, updates. Following that, Diana Belton, Jean Wallace, Daniela Bremer, and Matt Hobrick will provide updates on the new work that their respective PR committees, PR is the World Road Association, uh, will be undertaking in the new 2024-2027 cycle that kicked off last month in Paris. As you know, international collaboration is critically important for all of us, as more of the critical transportation challenges that we are facing are global in nature, and global challenges require a global approach for a solution. We will then transition into our ASHTO uh, Committee on Performance-Based Management business meeting with the um, subcommittee task force and working group updates. With that, let's get started. Next slide, please. So first on our agenda is um, Anna McLaughlin and an update uh, you know, from ASHTO. Uh, Anna is the Program Director for Transportation Program Management. Anna? Thanks so much, Christos. Um, it's good to see everyone here. Thank you for joining us today. Um, I do have one slide if you could. Yeah, thank you, Lori. <laughs> um, I just had a couple of things I wanted to touch base on today. Um, and I think we'll hear more about the NPRM when Ryan talks later today, but I did want to just let everybody know um, the comments are due on March 12th, 
Ashto did complete drafting our comment letter. It has been completed and sent off to um, Ashto President Craig Thompson for review. I shared that with everyone this afternoon so that you can kind of see what the Ashto comments were um, and encourage everyone to um, submit on behalf of your state DOT. So if that's something in the works, you can you can see what the Ashto um, comments were. If someone, I did send that out to our CPBM list, but if someone didn't receive that and need me to send a copy, um, send me a chat and I'm happy to do that. Um, I also just want to say thank you to everyone for submitting your comments in from each of the states. Um, and thank you to a huge shout out to Ryan. Ryan, thank you so much. Thank you so much for all your work on this one. Um, it was a, it was a shorter time frame than we would have liked. And, um, we, you know, the turnaround was really quick. So it was a lot of hectic kind of get it done. And we all appreciate everyone's help with that. So thank you. Um, I also just want to talk, just mention quickly that Ashto has kicked off our, our reauthorization process. Um, and there will be more coming um, in the coming months, more information on that. We expect to have like a more fleshed out schedule. But kind of our plan is, the ASHTO plan is that committees will be developing and approving um, policy recommendation white papers. We're writing, uh, we're drafting a total of eight papers across all of our ASHTO committees. Um, uh, um, white paper number three will be performance-based management planning and data. Um, so we'll be working with the committee on planning and the committee on data for, for data, data management and analytics um, to craft one white paper. Uh, that will kind of roll up to kind of the, all of the uh, reauthorization documents that Ashto has. Um, we're looking at a time frame of like August to have that white paper drafted. So that is something that we'll be working on. I am especially interested in getting any volunteers. I know this is something our policy and rulemaking work group will be working on. So if there are, but if there's anyone that's especially interested in kind of helping us through that process or has really strong feelings about what reauthorization should look like, um, I would love to get your, um, let me know, let me know, because I would like to have your interest so that we can keep you in the loop, because um, it will be, again, another team effort. Um, and then I just wanted to quickly mention that um, the perform our TSP, so we are the kind of, you know, we have been in a transition moving away from the pooled fund into the Ashto Performance Management TSP. And I have been working with um, the, the UMD CAT Lab. A lot of states use the pass the services through the TSP for the CAT Lab. And we'll be sending out letters of commitments. I'm, they should be going out next week for FY25. So they, those and those will be going out to the contacts that we have. Um, if anyone has any questions um, about that, again, feel free to reach out to me and let me know, but you'll be seeing those coming um, next week. And then one last thing, I could just put a plug in for the joint meeting. And I have a whole slide for that. Ta-da! Um, we're hoping to have a registration page up in the next month, but I hope everyone can mark their calendars to um, join us in St. Louis. We're very excited about that. We'll be meeting jointly with the um, Committee on Data Management and Analytics and the Committee on Planning. Uh, so that should be a fun conference. Uh, we also, just a, a reminder, if anyone is interested in specific topics, a survey did go out about that. So we are kind of collecting interest on specific topics. So if anyone has anything that they would like to see covered or have a special interest in or would like to present, um, be sure to fill out that survey. Um, and that's it for me. Thanks, Christos. Thank you, Anna. I mean, and really a huge thank you for Anna for the leadership that she's provided since uh, she joined not that long ago, but, um, you know, having to deal with uh, so many things um, at the same time and helping us keep moving things along. Um, please, please, when you get the TSP commitment letters, you really need to sign up for them. Uh, it's what, it's what go, is what is going to help us continue 
um, providing the benefits that we are providing to everyone through these webinars and a lot of other technical support that we have been providing uh, through the pooled fund uh, in years past. Um, with that, next, we're gonna hear from uh, uh, Mashtoni Smith Jackson. Uh, Mish has over 20 years of experience in transportation civil engineering, and she rejoined Federal Highway Administration in September of 2022 as the team leader for performance and asset managers, uh, management. She manages the TPM and asset management programs, including rulemaking, performance management uh, form, um, the transportation asset management program, recertification, consistency determinations, as well as guidance and technical assistance and development. But even above that, she's really has been a great partner working with us and the committee on performance-based management. Uh, Mish? Thanks, Christos. Sounds like I'm pretty busy there with that uh, intro. I can't believe, Anna, you missed that low-hanging fruit of saying, meet me in St. Louis. I mean, that that I just felt that come on. So forgive my, uh, my funniness here. But uh, I just wanted to give you guys a couple of updates on what we're doing on uh, the federal highway side. We are gearing up and preparing for our 2024 TPM reporting and significant progress determination, uh, which will be happening uh, this fall. Uh, we're also, um, I believe I briefed you all at our last quarterly meeting uh, that our team has grown, my team has grown, and we have also taken on the technical assistance and uh, training development role within my team. So you'll be seeing some information coming out from my team soon of how you all can uh, reach out to us to uh, make requests for technical assistance and training development. Um, we also are in the beginning stages of a new project to revisit the TAMPS from 2022. Um, you all may have been around when we did this project with the initial TAMPS back in 2018, 2019, and we are reigniting uh, re that project to see how we have changed over time. Um, and we are also launching an FHWA onboarding program that is focused on the transportation asset performance. So both the asset and the performance management side of the house, which will be internal to FHWA for new uh, points of contact at our division offices and to um, uh, generate that internal education program through an onboarding. Um, Anna already mentioned that we have a uh, brand new rulemaking that came out in December, the greenhouse gas uh, final rulemaking, and that there is also an NPRM that's out on the street um, and comments are due next Tuesday, March 12th. So please do, we're looking forward to hearing from you all. I encourage you to make your comments to the docket as soon as possible. Um, and uh, that's the updates that I have for today. Thank you. Am I turning it over to Ryan? Thank you, Mish. I'll, um, do we have any questions for Mish? I'll save them for later. So we'll now transition into a feature presentation um, with Ryan Huff. Ryan is uh, Chief Strategy Officer at the Nebraska DOT, where his role is to improve the department's own smart data-driven decision-making. He's chair of the policy and rulemaking subcommittee within the Astros Committee on Performance Based Management and Lori Fizet, um, with Lori Fizet from Rhode Island DOT uh, serving as vice chair. Uh, Ryan will be presenting today, as I mentioned earlier, on policy in action. And Ryan, thank you so much for taking the lead. When you volunteer in Providence to do it, I know that you really didn't know what you were getting yourself into it but you have a really good idea about it now. Definitely. So all I, yours. I, I appreciate the opportunity to, to talk today. I know we've got a lot going on in our world and I think that that's part of the reason why uh, Christos sort of tasked me with, with talking about this topic. It's a very timely topic. I think a lot of you are, are, are familiar with, with policy making, but um, for those that might not be, Christos thought it might be useful for to walk us through some of the 
some of the aspects of policymaking, um, why rulemaking is important, um, and just sort of, you know, center ourselves around sort of this idea of, you know, how do we, how do we balance all these things in, 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 in policymaking to, to for the right outcomes. And so um, Christos mentioned our group, the policy make rulemaking work group. We, we meet monthly on every second Tuesday um, at, at 1 p.m. Eastern. Um, we sit around and talk about all the different things that are happening in, in the policy and rulemaking world. Um, Anna and, and Mish mentioned a few of those things. I'll mention them a little bit at the end of my presentation, but I wanted to start off by, um, you know, talking a little bit about, let's see, um, just policy in general. I, I think just to define it as, as to get us going, you know, it's just an approach to, to doing something, you know, whatever that, that defined approach is for your organization with regard to, to many things. And, 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 and it, it's not just sort of in, in, in the transportation world, it can be in your HR realm. I've, I, I've listed the work from home. That's a, a very common policy many of us work with. Um, some of us that are former are recovering traffic engineers, you know, work with access control policies. These things help us control, um, you know, sort of access points along the highway to sort of minimize conflicts. Um, in Nebraska, we have a cable median guardrail policy, something that sort of marries up uh, data analytics and some research to define when is it cost effective to include cable median guardrail in our projects. There's a lot of incidental hits that, that drives up maintenance costs, um, but at the same time, we know they sort of minimize those, um, you know, cross median crashes, head on crashes. So there's a lot of value to those. And then um, I guess more germane to this group is, is some of those policies related to performance. Um, um, Lori in, in our work group mentioned uh, the, the policy related to performance and bridges. So if, you know, for three consecutive years, more than 10% of NHS bridge deck area is classified as structurally deficient, the state must sort of obligate more funds for those, for those bridges. And so these are just some quick examples of policies we, we, we work with, we see every day, but um, I wanted to take um, a step back and, and just talk about why are policies important? There, there are many aspects of, of you know, policy and, and, and what they do for us. Um, first and foremost, they, they give us direction and, and guide what we do. I think you know, we, we work in large organizations that we, we deal with a lot of complex decision making every day. Um, the way we behave and the decisions we make, if you know, with good policy, they can help us sort of begin pulling all in the same direction. Um, they also promote sort of consistency and fairness. Um, so wherever you have a standard, you can sort of begin to apply um, what you do in, in a more fair and, and sort of equitable way. Um, so it's important to, to maintain, you know, to have policies that, that, that do this. Um, risk management is another thing that, that it helps us do. There's lots of threats and, um, to what we do, a lot of vulnerabilities out there. Um, if we have good policies, they can, they can help us mitigate those things um, by, by sort of standardizing what we do. Um, you know, if we're, if another risk is, is legal liability risk. If, if, we're, if we're, you know, applying policies um, we can maintain sort of that standard and, and make sure we're, we're hitting, checking all the boxes, complying with relevant laws and regulations, industry standards, things like that. So helps us manage, manage our, our legal liability. Um, good policy also promotes efficiency. Um, I think that if you, you know, streamlining operations and um, clarifying our roles is really important. Um, if we don't know these things, we can't be effective. So, um, through good policy, good, good efficient policy, we can be we can we can be cost effective and more productive. Um, we also can promote the the values and culture of our organization. Um, you know, we, we want to sort of reinforce desired behaviors and norms, and sort of you know let people know what we're about. And so, um, you know, having policies can kind of create shared purpose uh, amongst your your team members. And lastly, um, having policies ensure stakeholder confidence. I think that when you have clear and, and, and well-implemented policies, your, your stakeholders can sort of begin to believe that, that you're sort of doing what's the best for, um, your, for their organization and for the public. And so um, all these things are, are sort of why, you know, we, we policies are important. I think um, 
there's a quiz later. So make sure you, you've taken a screenshot of this. No, I'm kidding. Um, but I will, I sort of will bake some of these concepts into later slides and, and sort of talk about why, you know, why some of these things a little bit later. So, um, you know, why are good policies important? I think as, as we thought about this topic, Christos, you know, wanted me to think through, you know, there, there's good policy and then there's you didn't want me to use the word bad, but just not as good policy maybe is what I'll say. Um, you know, good policies reduce kind of the following. R rigidity is one of those things when we have policies that are too rigid, um, they, they hinder innovation and adaptability. Um, as you know, we, 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 we work in a rapidly changing industry and, you know, the circumstances of, of that affect kind of the work we do change regularly and rapidly. And so we need to have uh, policies that, that are flexible to some degree and, and help minimize rigidity. Um, we want good policies that, that reduce complexity as well. Um, wherever we run into this, you know, we have we sort of run into the problem of people, you know, being confused and or having challenges with, with carrying out the policy. Um, that can lead to sort of compliance issues and, and, and other legal issues. If, if we're not, if our team members are unable to, our, 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 our partner organizations are unable to fulfill the, the obligations of policy, you know, we, we run into these compliance issues and that, that, that creates risk. Um, uh, you know, like I mentioned before, there's lots of threats and, and vulnerabilities in, in what we do. And so having a good policy can, can help sort of minimize um, those things. Um, and this is a big one in my mind, one of the most overlooked and you know, sort of problematic pieces of, of, of have, having bad policy is just those unintended consequences. Um, I have several case studies in, in subsequent slides, but the one thing that when I first started thinking about this, I thought about this, the, the Wells Fargo scandal, the, the cross-selling scandal that happened you know, a few years back, um, the, 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 the policy and or sort of reward system was created uh, to, to have um, their employees try and get, you know, their, their customers to, to sign up for additional services. Um, and since the reward system was, you know, the more you can open, the more you're going to get rewarded. That's just what happened, except not in the way they wanted. Um, turns out, uh, employees of Wells Fargo opened up, you know, 1.5 million additional checking and savings accounts and another 500,000 new credit cards for their existing customers without their knowledge. And so, um, you know, without, without sort of thinking through how they created this reward system, it, it ended up costing them $185 million in fines. And so, you know, that's an example of just outside the transportation industry, you know, um, when you create a thing, that you ask your, your team members to follow. Here's what we're about. Here's what we want to get done. You can, if you don't think it through, you could have some problems. And so the next few slides are focused on that. Um, at least from, from my experience, I just sort of reflected on things um, that I've come across in my travels that, that you know, some, some recent, some less recent that, that sort of relate to, to uh, unintended policy consequences. Um, the first one I'll start with was actually, you know, has some relevance to our organizational management um, subcommittee run by uh, Gary Van Such. It, I was running a, our, our first ever Kaizen process improvement, continuous improvement project at, at, in, in state government and um, went back in 2016. And our governor at the time was very into sort of um, figuring out how to improve processes, how to minimize waste um, and, and bringing about, bringing um, sort of formal methods into state government to, to tackle those things. And the first project we, we tackled was this checking, you know, insurance coverage for at-fault drivers. There was a state law on the books that required the DOT to work with DMV and um, insurance companies to verify that wherever there was a crash, the driver at fault had insurance. And so wherever that, we ran into that, we do check. Um, if they, they had the insurance, we just stop the check. That, that's good to go. Um, wherever we ran into a problem where there was no insurance, you know, uh, it was up, uh, you know, incumbent upon the DMV to sort of, you know, pursue punitive, um, you know, punitive action on that driver. So points off license, suspension of license, those types of things. 
Um, you know, the idea being that, you know, protecting the public from uninsured drivers is good. I mean, you know, we all have a role to play in, in, in maintaining insurance. It keeps insurance costs low. Um, someone needs to sort of take responsibility for those crashes. That, that's a good thing, right? You know, so um, we, 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 we think about it that way. Um, but as we got into our project, you know, we did a lot of process mapping and, and data collection. Um, you know, we wanted to understand how this process, this, this policy that was given to us, and it's in, it was actually codified in state statute, you know, DOT and DMV shall check this. Um, we found that um, this process took 44 days to check, um, but we found that, that the actual time we were spending touching the thing, processing, was only about 15 minutes. So it took 44 days to complete 15 minutes of worth of work. And so that's clearly out of whack. And so we, we spent a lot of time sort of figuring out where the, the, the lead time was taking too long and things like that. We had 70,000 crashes a year in Nebraska. And so you can, as you can imagine, the time spent on this process really added up and, and really there was a lot of delay, a lot of inventory, um, things all you process improvement people sort of cringe at, myself included. Um, and so we, we were able to, through our, our Kaizen, uh, shave that 44 days down to 1.5 days. Uh, but that's not really the headline. The, the headline here was the policy itself not the process. Um, and that's why I bring this up. We, we had a policy um, intended to protect the public. And, you know, it, it's, it's sort of, we, we, we sort of, as we were looking at it, we said, boy, we're not seeing a lot of drivers without insurance, at least the ones that are at fault. Like, and, and so we, we, we checked it and the percent of all drivers that didn't have insurance that were at fault was only 0.007%. So, we were spending hours and hours and, and days and weeks working on this thing that almost never happened. And so, you know, we, we brought this to the attention of our governor and elected officials in, in the legislature. And we said, uh, we don't think this is effective. We don't think this is a good use of, of taxpayer dollars. And they agreed. And so, you know, it's a situation where we think, you know, boy, this is a good thing for taxpayers. But you know, is it really effective? Um, you know, especially when we're chasing something that that almost never happens. And, and through this, without even checking in this or looking at this, um, you, we would have never known. So um, this is one of those situations where sort of good intentions get in the way of, of, of sort of what is actually happening. And so you've got to be careful about the policies you act, even if they, they sound good. Um, and so that's just sort of an example I, I, I use from sort of state government in, in Nebraska. I'm, I'm sure you all have things like that that you don't see as adding any value, but um, I highly, highly recommend, you know, process improvement for, for things like this um, if, you're, if you're interested in changing what's going on. Um, another case study is, is the National Electric Vehicle Infrastructure Program. For those that aren't aware, this is the new formula program that was put into the bipartisan infrastructure law. Um, the program itself is intended to create a, a network of electric vehicle charging infrastructure across the United States, such that it uh, sort of reduces range anxiety for, for EV owners, and, and, and hopefully in the, in the end induces electric vehicle adoption to, to drive down sort of carbon emissions. Um, so it's a great program, um, but in Nebraska, uh, you know, we, we, we're trying to run the program, we're trying to get our program up and running. Um, I bring this up because there are many sort of policy aspects, lots of rules and guidelines associated with the NEVI program. You can see a few, I have a couple of bullets here telling you where you must build first, that these things must be publicly accessible, you have to have a plan. Um, but um, when they first started this program, they, they did a rulemaking, uh, you know, a sort of um, where they asked for information from states and, and they eventually enacted a rule that says these EV stations must sell in units of power or by kilowatt hours. And, and you might wonder why that's important. It's important because um, the alternative to this is selling power in units of time. So how long you're plugged in. And that's not the most transparent way of selling uh, electricity. Um, this is because battery batteries in these EVs are engineered differently. Some um, accept maximum charge at the expense of the battery's lifespan, whereas um, some are engineered to just sort of incrementally take power and to optimize the, the, the overall battery life. 
Um, you know, but but the idea being that selling by units power, that the consumer can be assured that they're what they're getting is 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 accurate. So uh, you know, I just these is this is just you know an example. You got vehicle A, they're plugged in for one hour, they might receive twelve kilowatts of power. These are made up numbers. Uh, vehicle B, on the other hand, same hour, same amount of money spent on that on that time, you know, gets less charge. And so you know, the idea. Um, you know, through the rulemaking was that selling in units of time provides the consumer with the greatest amount of transparency. And that's, that's good, right? We want, we want transparency in, in, in these things. It's tax, these are things are funded by taxpayer dollars, you know, from a policy point of view, you know, that's good, right? Um, for Nebraska, that, that created a, a challenge. And, and this example is intended to show you where sometimes federal policymaking can actually interfere with, with state policy making. And so I mentioned that on the surface, that is a good policy. Um, but in this particular case, it, it turns out it, it's slightly more rigid than, than state law in Nebraska allows. And this is obviously a, a unique and, and very specific example, but I think it, 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 it points it out um, what I'm trying to get across. In Nebraska, we're probably one of the only states in the union that is 100% public power all throughout the state. And that's good because it keeps our power costs low, um, but it also means that public power is only interested in their, their, their sort of singular business model, which is wholesale, uh, you know, wholesaling the you know, power for, for, for cities and, and governments. And so um, our state statute says that only they are allowed to sell uh, in units of power and, and that creates a problem because our public power entities do not want to own, operate, run um, these a, a, a public charging station. They just, in their minds and in the DOT's minds, additionally, we're not in, I call it the gas station business. Uh, gas station owners, the fuel retailers, they are in the gas station business and they, they see a huge opportunity with these NAVI funds. They are very interested, um, but because of this statute, they are sort of unable to fulfill those that federal requirement of selling by unit power. So you've got the federal policy over here and you've got this, the state law over here, um, which means you know, effectively um, NDOT can't, can't sort of move forward. We, you know, public power doesn't wanna do this, the, the, the private sector does, but we've got this, this law. And so um, when the rulemaking or the, 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 the request for information came out, we were very, very clear with them. We can't do this, our state statutes prohibit this. Um, even so, they move forward. And so here we are. Um, we've been trying for the last two years to get state statute changed so we can do this with our private sector uh, partners. Um, and, and it's still kind of hung up in the legislature this current session. But um, this is just an example of just, you know, even though you've got a well-intentioned policy, it, 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 could, it could have these other unintended consequences. You got to be, you got to be thoughtful. And, and, and I, I think, to be fair, I think, you know, we're a very isolated incident. So instance of this, so, you know, uh, making that change is probably the best, but here, here's Nebraska over here. We're having trouble uh, trying to fulfill and, and, and do what's right for the taxpayer with these funds. So just an example of where, you know, policies can interfere with each other. Um, the last one I'll, I'll point out, um, I, I'll mention is just NEVI and, and Buy America. I mentioned NEVI it's this program, its intent is to build up this network and, and, and create all these benefits for the environment through reduced EV adoption and, and reduction of greenhouse gases. Um, at the same time, you also have Buy America, which is apl applicable to all federal aid programs, you know, making sure that uh, equipment and, 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 and resources are sourced in America. And, and, and you know, those two things on the surface those are great, you know, in, inducing, you know, EV adoption and creating domestic jobs. I mean, good. Those are both good things. Um, but, um, you know, it, from, from, from our perspective as, as folks trying to uh, push EV charging equipment out the door and, and getting these things in place to fill their intended um, thing, you know, we've got, to, we've got to think about manufacturers of these equipment. They, they've never had these funds before and they've never had this requirement to be domestically sourced. And so as we talk with these equipment providers, they're having to sort of domesticate where, you know, where they get their materials, move their operations to the United States. And, and you know, all of that takes time and expense. Um, adding that up to, you know, adding that to this sudden demand of 
50 plus states that are all interested in this, this limited resource, this Buy America compliant resource, um, you've got competition and, and those things drive prices up, delay construction, um, et cetera. Um, you add that to just general, general complexity of, of federal laws and, and, and you get, a, you get this, 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 this unintended consequence of just delays and added costs and all these things up. And so, um, you know, all these things in my mind, you know, my experience and in my discussions with the industry and other states on this, you know, it, it, these things begin to kind of limit the, the, the effectiveness or the ability of these programs to achieve their intended goal. And so, um, you know, we got to be careful about weighing those things out. And, and those aren't, obviously, these things aren't for me to make a judgment call on. But um, this is just an example of where, you know, policies can, can kind of, um, you know, run into each other, if you will. And so, you know, how do we avoid negative policy consequence? Um, that's, you know, what our work group is there for, our, our Committee on Performance Safe Management is for. It's about sort of actively um, engaging around policy and, and, and doing thoughtful analysis. And, and we've, Anna mentioned it before, many of you have already done that through the, with the most recent NPRM. Um, it takes, you know, careful planning when, when considering a policy. I know that FHWA and other federal government, government agencies, you know, spend a lot of time thinking through these policy consequences and they don't let these things go come out lightly. Um, once those are in place, you know, or, or proposed, you must review those things uh, to make sure that they, they're, they're, they're good, uh, they don't have these problems. Um, once they're in place, you know, you've got to implement them. Um, Anna mentioned the greenhouse gas final rule and, and, and target setting for that. You know, we're beginning to move into the implementation phase. Um, eventually, we need to move into that monitoring phase where we sort of think through, you know, how this policy is working. I mentioned the Nebraska uh, specific case study. We, we went ahead and monitored that policy related to at-fault drivers um, and found that it's not working. And so we, we went ahead and changed that. So um, I, I, the greenhouse gas, this is an example of just a, a final finalized rule. Um, how, do we, how do we work with finalized policy? Um, how do we uh, you know, monitor that and things like that? Um, we've engaged with our, our members. You know, we, we see what the policy says or the rules say, um, what do we do with that? And how do we, how do we uh, you know, comply with it? How do we you know, make it effective for what we're trying to accomplish? Um, we did a um, survey you know, and our members told us you know, there, there are several things that we're interested in. You know, target setting best practices is one of them. Uh, how do we leverage tools and other data to support some of the implementation and compliance with, with this, this new rule? Uh, and lastly, how do we marry that up to what I call adjacent efforts? There's many of us that have statewide initiatives or federal, or, you know, executive orders um, that, that require us to do it. other things. There are other federal programs, CMAC program, the Carbon Reduction Program. How do we sort of work those things together to sort of um, you know, work towards the center of that Venn diagram. You know, our, our job as sort of, uh, you know, policy and rulemaking is to help uh, us, us get, there, get to a point where we can all um, effectively comply and, and, and excel at, at compliance on these things. So um, I mentioned that was an example of a kind of a finalized rule. Those that are in draft, the NPRM, we mentioned at the, at the beginning, um, these are sort of proposed rules that, that need our review, and many of you have participated in that review and, and offered your comments to Ashto, and we appreciate that. Um, that's very useful. Um, the, 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 the way I think of, of rulemaking um, as, a, as, a, as a collective sort of transportation industry, you know, we're trying to balance things. Um, you know, we've got um, the regulator on one side trying to maintain consistency and fairness, Yet at the same time, you know, making sure things are compliant with laws, and lastly, you know, making sure things are sort of aligning with that the value system of uh, the current administration. Um, they've got to balance those things against the complexity of a rule, and and so, um, you know, how complex should we make this? Um, we want to try and minimize that, I guess. Um, states and and the regulated, as I call them, you know, we're trying to to in our comments you know, in the, the rulemaking comments, 
say this is, you know, maybe this is too complex and we need to minimize that. Um, we're also, through our analyses, trying to illustrate where it could create operational inefficiencies or, or other conflicts. And so in the end, the, the rulemaking process itself is an attempt to sort of, I call, think of it as balance these things. Um, and so, you know, it is tough. There, there's many things um, to consider. Um, there's this complex uh, landscape of, of uh, geographies and, 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 and statutory frameworks all across the nation and how do we how do we navigate these things it takes it takes that that review that careful consideration that the engagement among amongst our members to make sure policy is is you know ends up uh, being effective so um, I'm going to start wrapping it up here you know our, our work group I mentioned you know follows these things and it's it's our job to kind of help keep our, our members plugged in um, for, for those that aren't familiar, the GHG final rule um, you know, recently was you know, published at the end of last year, said that targets must be submitted by the start of February. Um, a, a lawsuit is, is, is sort of in the, in, in the process right now. And so FHWA has chosen to um, delay the, the enforcement of that target, that, 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 that deadline. And so the new, the new enforcement deadline is the, the end of March. And so um, if you haven't had a chance um, to talk with your MPOs or think through your target setting, you still have some time on that. Um, be, be willing to talk a little bit more about that if you have any questions. Um, I won't mention much more about the NPRM that's out there. Anna, I think, sufficiently covered that. Um, we got a lot of great comments. Um, some concerns out there. Um, some of the changes, you know, are, are sort of good to go. Uh, but overall, we hope that um, through the, the rulemaking process, we can get some of our, our comments addressed. Um, I'll, I'll wrap it up by just saying you can find our, our, our work group just at the TPM portal. This is um, you know, where we manage and maintain all of the, the different subcommittees and work groups. You can find our work group um, by just going to the community tab and, and clicking on the CPBM and scrolling down to the uh, policy rulemaking work group. And so that's where we manage and maintain some of the, the, the resources and information we um, provide and, and publish for our members. And so I'll stop there, I'll wrap it up and just ask if there are any questions about those things. Ryan, we do have um, two questions actually in, in the chat. Mm -hmm. One uh, from Larry. Um, are many agencies using methods such as scenario analysis and or causal analysis for exploring or identifying and understanding unknown uncertainties or unintended consequences? That is a great question that I love because I have a, a, a I actually have an example. Um, and I can just I can just reflect on my own um, our own experiences. Um, electric vehicle adoption is a is a is a growing concern amongst policymakers, namely because the primary source of our income, our revenues is gas tax. What happens when, uh, you know, what, what sort of adoption scenarios would it take for us to have our, our programs interfered with? And this was something um, a previous director of ours really wanted to tackle. And so we, we worked with um, one of our consultant partners to develop a scenario tool that that sort of looked at and let you as the user play with um, adoption scenarios and, and different. Um, so you could say, hey, you know, adoption in Nebraska is going to be pretty, pretty, pretty slow. Um, you could also adopt in a scenario that it, it adopts that, that kind of hockey stick uh, adoption curve where you, you sort of reach critical mass at a certain point and and, and through that, you, you'd sort of progress through a series of decisions that you as the users that can make about a scenario. Um, the final <clears throat> slide make, lets you pick fuel, the fuel, uh, electric vehicle registration fees or other things that could offset those things. And we use this extensively with our, our legislative um, partners to, to sort of show them, hey, if this happens, you know, you, we might need to consider a new or increased registration fee. Or if you do this, um, you may need to start taxing electricity. And um, those things are, are been very useful. And so, yes, yeah, scenario analysis is incredibly powerful when you when you want to think through a policy. So, I hopefully that answered the question. But we've 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 had found success with 
with scenario planning tools at, at Nebraska DOT. Thank you, Ryan. Um, there are things that we have that are actually mostly, they are more comments rather than question. So we can always come back at the end after that and following uh, great presentation as always. Thank you to uh, both you and Lori for leading us through this time of a lot of policies coming out and uh, you know working together with the um, leadership of the Committee on Performance-Based Management and Anna to formulate our, uh, our response. So uh, with that, we're gonna move on to um, some of the updates from the PR cycle and what we're gonna be working on over the next four years. And uh, first up is Diana Belton, uh, who's the Director of Performance Risk and Investment Analysis within Minnesota DOT's Office on Transportation System Management. Uh, Diana co-chairs the Committee on Performance-Based Management's Task Force on Emerging uh, Performance Areas. And she's a working group leader for PRCs TC11, um, you know, focusing on uh, public value creation. Diana? Thanks. Okay, so uh, next slide where I already see a typo. Um, I'm going to go over our last cycle quickly, which was actually 2020 to 2023. I have no idea what the, that year range is there. So uh, performance of transport administrations, TC1.1 has been a longstanding committee and doing good work uh, building on, on prior cycles. Last cycle, we explored three um, in three working groups, one on customer experience and public value creation, emerging and disruptive technologies, and then the third being workforce and diversity, equity, and inclusiveness. And I should mention that our, our task, our, excuse me, our TC, our technical committee won an award for that work on diversity and inclusion, and that was a really proud moment for us, and it was actually the first award that ERC has given on that topic. So with this work though, what common threads emerged uh, in the three working groups, really how transportation agencies need to evolve to address the changing behavior and expectations of customers and stakeholders all over the world. Next slide. So at some point along uh, the, the cycle, Christos envisioned this uh, framework and um, that with people and society at the center and along the way others help develop this a little bit more and it really seems we would like agencies should be the north star that their north star for guiding the future of transport should be that everything we should do should be with people and society in mind and similar ideas have been coming out of other places like the trb critical issues in transportation uh, and then the nchrp moonshot project also new visions in transportation Asian agencies like Utah using the quality of life framework and Iowa making lives better through transportation. So this is going to continue to evolve, but we're pretty excited about this, um, this idea. Next slide. So with our new cycle, with the correct dates, we are going to extend our work with uh, the umbrella topic of transport, the transport agency of the future. And we would be furthering the analysis with the three topic areas, envisioning this transporta transport agency of the future, public value creation by transport agencies, and creating a stronger workforce, a stronger future focused workforce. We're also gonna be getting some support from the TC, uh, the Communications Commission of PR, because we've been asked to, about a cross cutting issue on how road and transport agencies can improve their image with the public and stakeholders. Next slide. So here's a little more detail than we actually need, but I wanted to have it be a little more inclusive on the slide that the issue one or the working group one being envisioning the transport agency of the future. This got a big jump start right before the cycle started by having a workshop at the World Road Congress in Prague last October, and then a similar one at TRB in January. You'll see some of the preliminary research questions and topics below and just kind of glance at these, but they're gonna be, there's gonna be some overlap with the other working groups. I just wanted to get those on there. And the next slide. The next one, public value creation. I wanna introduce this one just to remind folks, or if they haven't heard it, that the public sector's measure of success is public value. It's similar to the private sector's bottom line of success being shareholder value. But with public investment, it obligates us 
to understand the values and aspirations of the communities we serve and to be efficient and effective in managing resources and to create public value. So we would like our approach to be aimed at improving outcomes in areas not traditionally measured by transportation is what we're going for here. And we have our preliminary research questions uh, on the slides here, we're going to be exploring these things and looking at frameworks and, and to come up with some best practices and recommendations over the four-year cycle. Next slide. Finally, our third issue, our working group three, includes the interrelated issues of talent management, new competencies, and as a result of technological disruptions taking place, and then um, to try to identify what makes an attractive employer. So they will, again, build on work from the prior cycle by further developing issues of the workforce modernization skills and enhancing diversity, equity, inclusion. And um, let's see. And so here we have their preliminary research questions. Since I just only have a few minutes, didn't want to read through those. But there are some overlaps with equity and looking at, at um, measures and and looking at what our mission statement should be and whatnot. So the other heads up that I actually got a clue to remind people of based on Matt Habrick, who had his slides in there early, is that PR will most certainly be looking at surveys and case studies. And so I would encourage you with, if you um, get one of those surveys requests to please fill it out. It really helps us. This is a the bulk of how we uh, get a lot of our additional information and then if you if follow up with case studies. And so just a heads up to clear your calendar for those. <laughs> um, anyway, it's my honor to be uh, serving this role and uh, thanks for your time. Thank you, Diana. And uh, next up is, of course, Diana is serving on the best committee for PIRC, um, but I'm very biased for that committee. Uh, next up is Jean Wallace from the Minnesota DOT. Uh, Jean is the Deputy Commissioner and Chief Engineer for the Minnesota DOT, and as you know, uh, Vice Chair of the ASTO Committee on Performance-Based Management. Uh, she'll be presenting on the upcoming work of Technica Committee 1.4, Planning the Resilience of Road Networks, Climate Change and Other Hazards. And I believe Jean, you have also um, taken on the mantle of a working group leader for uh, TC 1.4. Um, Actually, I am not at this ooh. time yet. Um, my arm hasn't been twisted enough yet, Christos. <laughs> Thank you very much, Christos. And uh, yep, there's the next slide. Mm -hmm. So um, this uh, TC is building on kind of a longstanding committee as well, uh, planning the resilience of road networks. Um, it's actually shifting from more of a climate adaptation focus to a resilience focus. And it's building on the work uh, the, that was completed in the last cycle on the PR, uh, PR climate change adaptation framework for road infrastructure, which is a, a very comprehensive document that was um, finalized in the last session in the last cycle. And the intent now is to take that climate adaptation framework and essentially adapt it to resilience um, activities and uh, taking an all hazards approach. So in, in this sense, it's a lot like the NCHRP 2332 project, which is developing the resilience guide um, for uh, transportation systems and for all taking all hazards approach. So I think there's going to be a lot of um, opportunity there to coordinate with that NCHRP project and with the ASHO task force. I'm really looking forward to that. So that's working group one's task is really to adapt that framework to from a climate change um, only adaptation framework to a resilience framework. And then we have a second working group that is looking at uh, developing or gathering some best practices and some case studies and understanding organizational resilience for road networks. And what we really mean by that is how transportation agencies are organized. And as it states here, to really understand resilience, implement resilience measures, measure it, evaluate the effectiveness of um, resilience. So uh, we even had a little bit of, uh, I think a little bit of back and forth on what this actually means in our first kickoff meeting, but um, it's not about uh, a resilient organization as it is about how an organization is, uh, well, organized 
how transportation agency is organized to support resilience and a resilient transportation system. So those are our two working, um, uh, working group efforts for this uh, next cycle. Um, I think there is some thought about trying to do the best practices survey earlier on in the cycle. So as Deanna just noted, uh, you may be getting a survey sometime, at least in the next four years, possibly in the next two years. Uh, we encourage you to certainly fill that out and share what you're doing in resilience um, within your organizations. And um, I will share that I'm serving on this, uh, and, and actually I'm probably gonna stay engaged with both working groups if possible. Uh, the other US representative is Rob Capilinos from the resilience team at the Federal Highway Administration in Washington, D.C. And uh, he was on the, um, this TC in the last cycle. And uh, so he brings a lot of good knowledge from how the climate adaptation framework was developed and uh, how we can certainly apply resilience to that. So looking forward to working with him and with all of our partners in this TC. I think that's all I needed to cover for today, but I'm certainly open to any questions. Thank you, Jean. And um, if folks have questions or if they want to know more, uh, please feel free to drop things in the chat line and we'll look at them and respond. Uh, next, we'll hear from Daniela Bremen from the Washington State DOT. Daniela is the Chief Innovation Officer uh, with Incorporative Automated Transportation and Technologies for the Department. She's also the Chair of the Joint Subcommittee on System Mobility and Emerging Technologies. She will be presenting on the uh, plan work for TC 2.5, Road Infrastructure for Connected and Automated Mobility. Uh, Daniela? Hi, thanks, Christos. I'm going to stay off camera because I have a very shaky connection, so I apologize for not being on, on video here. Uh, can you hear me okay right now? Yes, we can. Yes. Okay, thank you. All right, so I... I was asked to join this uh, TC25 Road Infrastructure and Connected and Automated Mobility Group. Um, it's interesting because it's a new group. It was uh, just uh, created. And um, so our, there's really no uh, precedence or you know, uh, longstanding engagement on this topic from the uh, members that participate on this. Also many members in our group, I have learned, um, have been longstanding members of PIARC. So, um, they have been working on other technical committees and have um, decided to move from one technical committee to another and been around for quite a while. So I learned a lot of interesting things, like some people have been involved uh, with PIAC for 20 years and have, have had multiple four-year stints, which is kind of interesting. We're moving from one committee to another. It's a little bit like TRB, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> so... So we had some benefit of some experience, but most of, I think most of the people in the room, um, we had, I think about 30 folks there uh, in Paris were really new and really trying to understand how PIA works, how this uh, road infrastructure for connected and automated mobility group should be um, functioning, what the focus should be. There were some predetermined um, work group focus areas that um, I think um, as Jean mentioned, there was um, a lot of discussion what these things meant that were inherited because the people in the room were not, you know, shaping or did not shape necessarily those those uh, uh, objectives, which made it kind of interesting. I think there is also um, an element from uh, of lost in translation, right? I think when you translate into a multiple language into one language and how things are being defined, um, it made it a little bit challenges. So we spent a lot of time, a really a lot of time trying to figure out what we were asked to accomplish and what we were asked to do on this topic. And so um, there we have developed four work, three work groups. And uh, the first work group is on roads for cooperative and connected and automated mobility, um, which, um, uh, is to identify the characteristics of functionalities of roads. You know, what, what does, what's required for us to uh, provide an able cooperative automated uh, transportation technologies. Now, the second group is very similar. So we spent a lot of time trying to figure out, uh, is it really one group? Is it really two groups? Um, we spent a lot of time trying to figure, tease out a little bit why number two is different from number one and in which way. And a lot of time was spent on that effort. 
Um, I think there's a lot of sort of overlap. And I think I, I'm going to trust the process that over time, as these two groups um, work on these topics, it will kind of become clear where one ends and one begins or where they overlap or not overlap. Because uh, it made it hard for people to figure out where they should volunteer. So when it came to the work group three, which I was asked to uh, co-chair, uh, I had kind of agreed to help out in the beginning. I didn't really know what I was getting into. <laughs> But, but I thought by the time we got to work group three, we were pretty worn out from the conversation, how one or two is different and what we're really trying to do and what is in the scope of a, a, a committee that we can actually, what can we accomplish? So I think I, I, I had the opportunity to kind of maybe reframe the, the discussion around three. So three is really about policy frameworks and business models. There was a lot of discussion about architecture and we realized very quickly that the intention of this particular element coming into um, uh, this, this new uh, technical committee was not ITS architecture, was not a technical architecture, was very much um, organizational structured architecture. So uh, we suggested to kind of use different words, not to confuse folks. Um, so policy frameworks and business models for public authorities and road organizations. What, how are we organizing ourselves? How do we structure ourselves? What policies, organizational, interesting conversation, the policy we just had, again, that kind of fits really well to this group's uh, effort. Um, how do we organize and structure? What business models are we using? And um, to enable the deployment of uh, technologies. Um, and there is still, I think there's still some searching and figuring out exactly how we want to structure this. It sounds like we're going to do surveys and case studies and use cases. And so very similar to the other technical committees. Uh, um, trying to figure out how uh, perhaps we can combine and uh, consolidate some of these surveys so we don't, you know, survey everyone to death. Um, but uh, there was a, a lot of emphasis. The other issue that was really hard for us was um, the, the idea of connected and automated mobility uh, technologies, deployments of those and applications of those in the different um in the different countries, it was a different income structure from high earning in, uh, uh, countries to low, you know, and the incomes um, countries. And I and that was that's kind of hard trying to create a, a work product that can apply equally across the board. I think that's going to be a little bit challenging. So we'll probably um, uh, explore that a little bit further. And then so the last the last item on this was interesting because a lot of people came to connect an automobile mobility because they have a very technical background. Um, so the people actually that I volunteered out of the 30 or so people volunteered, and I'm sure more will be volunteering who probably will do it remotely or over email because they were not in the room. But uh, most of those tended to really want to talk about the technology deployments under work group one and work group two. So in the end, we really had hardly no volunteers at all because people said, I'm not a policy person. I am a technical person. I don't know anything about policy and frameworks and business models. And it was kind of interesting because that would lead me to think that maybe this work group three need to collaborate with some other groups, uh, other technical committees in order to maybe um, bring some uh, participants to bear that have some of that experience. So anyway, I think it, um, I think in the end we came up with a good sort of um, resolution of what we were trying to pursue. But I think there's still some vagueness and some clarity needed, and also um, how are we going to attract some participants to that number three uh, topic if if everybody else in that technical committee is really technically focused. Thank you, Daniela. <clears throat> and uh, wrapping up, this part of the agenda is Mad Hoprick from Iowa DOT, where he serves as the Transportation Asset Management Administrator for the department. Uh, Mad is the chair of uh, the co-chair of the Committee on Performance Based Management Subcommittee on Asset Management, and he'll present on the upcoming uh, working groups and activities for TC 3.3 Asset Management. Mad. All right. Thank you very much. <clears throat> yeah, this will be a bit of a study in contrast uh, from from Daniela's group because the asset management uh, committee has been around for a while, so we're we're pretty well established. In fact, we're one of the few um, committees that actually maintains a a, a document, a manual, and I'm going to actually post a link to that in the um, um, in the chat here for today's meeting. Um, that um, asset management manual has been around uh, for a few cycles now, and and just to kind of reiterate for 
for everyone kind of following along here. The way PRC is, is sort of structured is that uh, there are, we operate on a four-year cycle, um, and every four years there's a, a World Road Congress event that takes place somewhere in the world. Um, the most recent one was in uh, Prague, and uh, that kind of is the capstone of a cycle. And then uh, we have just uh, started the kickoff of the next four-year iteration. And every four years, the, the PRC organization reevaluates all of the committees, determines uh, what specific activities they want that committee to work on. Uh, for the coming four years, and then to be able to deliver um, in time for the next World Road Congress, uh, which in our, our case will be taking place in um, Vancouver. Um, so uh, looking forward to that opportunity. And actually, really being here in North America may be something for folks to think about uh, being able to attend uh, possibly a little bit more easily than than if it were uh, somewhere somewhere else in the world that is not as convenient to get to. In any case, um, I wanted to share some of the things that uh, we are working on within our working group. We had uh, originally had four um, areas that we were focusing on. Uh, the first one um, attracted a lot of interest. It was really focused around using technology to help uh, with asset management. And so we actually ended up splitting that into really two subgroups, one focusing more on uh, the relationship between BIM or, or digital delivery and asset management, and the second one uh, focusing on innovative data collection and analysis, uh, including uh, artificial intelligence uh, techniques. Um, the second uh, task uh, uh, or kind of group of, uh, of work will be uh, related to measuring and reducing risk and improving the resilience of road networks. So again, kind of touching on that resilience issue that the Gene uh, brought up earlier. And in fact, one of the things we'll, we'll be doing within the asset management uh, committee is coordinating with uh, that committee as well as others on the issue of resilience. We have um, uh, our topic three is renewal and rejuvenation of aging infrastructure. And that's really looking at, uh, um, uh, particularly as we have infrastructure that is uh, um, towards the, the, the middle part or end of its life, kind of what we might consider to be uh, you know, a, a fair, low fair condition or a poor condition maybe, what are the opportunities and options for renewing and rejuvenating that infrastructure? And then the fourth working group will be focusing on updating the content of that manual that I re referenced a moment ago. So if you have a chance to look at the manual, you'll notice that um, it is uh, uh, a much, uh, very, very much kind of a lightweight document. It certainly has some rich content in it, but it is uh, not uh, as uh, feature rich, I would say, as, uh, for example, the AASHTO Asset Management Guide, which hopefully many of you are familiar with or your, your agency's asset management uh, folks, hopefully, or at least are familiar with the AASHTO guide. Um, however, as the as the 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 PIRC manual has been done uh, entirely by the those that are working within the working groups, um, uh, I think it's a it's a great document and can support asset management activities um, around the world, especially for low and medium income countries. Next slide, please. Uh, I'll kind of just a little quick introduction to the team. We have me as kind of the main member that uh, we don't actually, it's not really a designation, but I don't know what else to call myself. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm the one that uh, gets my travel funded to go to these meetings. Uh, we have these uh, other members, including Meredith Hill, who I see as on the call today, Tasha Clemens, Derek Constable from Federal Highway that serve as what we call corresponding members who are able to participate in the work of the committee, but do not have uh, uh, their travel funded. The USA also has nominated two associate members. We have Katie Zimmerman and Omar Smadi that participate in the committee as well. And I'm gonna be coordinating with all the members to ensure that there are opportunities to engage with and support the work of the committee. And um, the committee will next meet in October in Birmingham, uh, UK, just before the Highways UK 2024 conference. Uh, when I talk about kind of coordinating U.S. members, the uh, the point there is to find opportunities for everyone to kind of engage with the work of those working groups and provide uh, supports to represent the uh, the U.S. Uh, in terms of uh, um, information and case studies that can be shared. Also, to participate in those groups and learn from those groups in, in a way that we can then uh, share and disseminate information we might be gleaning from uh, other international colleagues back with the asset management community at large. So. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, I do want to make sure to point out our homepage, and from this homepage, you can get a link to that asset management manual. Um, and um, 
Uh, so uh, please feel free to check that out. I think uh, the slides are available, so you can don't, don't have to copy down this whole big long link, but hopefully you can find the slide and, and get right into it. Uh, the committees will be having, uh, or the committee will be having two virtual meetings per year in addition to the two in-person meeting opportunities. Those uh, virtual meetings um, uh, will we'll be looking for um, uh, information, case studies, possible presenters uh, for seminars and conferences and discussions about kind of the ongoing work that, that the committee has to deliver on those objectives that are set forward in our terms of reference. So um, uh, I'll, I'll be working with the asset management community to make sure that information is kind of being shared in both directions about what is happening and to help uh, bring um, bring uh, international best practices uh, uh, to light here in the United States and also to share some of the great things that we have going on in the U.S. with uh, uh, the international community. So uh, that's all I have to share, I think, on this one, Lori. Um, Thank you, Matt. Yeah. Um, this is really great work from uh, all of our uh, presenters and representatives uh, to share what they're going to be working on in the future. Um, we're going to be looking for opportunities um, over the next uh, you know, three plus years to be bringing you updates on the work, not only asking you to fill out surveys and case studies, but also to be sharing uh, with you uh, some of the work that we are doing uh, as, uh, as it's been completed and is getting published. So um, next on our agenda, we're actually going to move into the business meeting and uh, updates from our um, you know, subcommittees, uh, task force and working groups, uh, starting with the research um, working group and the co-chair said block and Alma uh, Mukanovic and from, uh, you know, and we'll turn it over to uh, Ed and Alma. I want to wish you a good afternoon, morning, or whatever part of the day um, you're experiencing right now. So um, the research work group is a cross-cutting uh, subcommittee that uh, stewards the research needs that come out of the um, Committee on Performance-Based Management through um, the to, for submittal for the NCHRP program, mainly. Although we maintain a complete listing of all research needs and the research management system at the TAM portal, tam-portal.org, um, so that anybody who's interested in, in um, helping with research can, can uh, find that. I, I lost the slide, so um, I wanted to give you a status on, we submitted three research needs. Um, William Johnson, uh, who has been the chair, and I, I've taken over since, um, for, for this year, he, he stewarded this process that resulted in three uh, research need statements submitted to the ACHRP. One is on workforce um, uh, curriculum development for asset management professionals. Another one on uh, creating public value, which we heard Deanna speak about a little bit. And another one advancing greenhouse gas um, integration into performance management and in, in the, in the transportation planning. Um, and and we also submitted a synthesis topic on on how uh, we want to know the state of the practice and how states manage their strategic in innovation initiatives. Um, how are they structured so that we can then formulate a great uh, research needs statement? So and I have action items for the past and the future. So for the past, the action item is I, I would like to ask all the uh, state DOT members in the audience. I think we're distributing an email with the re three research statements, and those are at states right now uh, for balloting for next year's program. And so the deadline for submittal back to Ashto is March 25th, but internally, each state has an earlier deadline from the subject matter experts or whatever process is used at the agency to prioritize which ones are important. And our message here is, for you to advocate for the ones um, that represent our committee's best thinking on, on research needs and, and, and our most er pressing needs. So um, you, these are the three titles and these are the numbers that you would see in the ballot. And so what you need to do is find out who manages research at your agency and make sure that um, you have a voice in how your state ballots it. And of course we want 
you to rate it a five, highest priority. And we've even provided a text via email that you can use to highlight the research needs statement and then advocate for it uh, because other people are advocating for their research needs and we want to make sure that ours gets taken care of as well. Um, but the next slide. So that's in the, um, the, these are the, you know, for example, in Connecticut, our deadline is March 11th. So that's just Monday. So we have to, uh, I, I dug around, found my research manager, and I'm sure that I'm either talking to the person balloting on the statement or uh, responding myself. Um, so uh, separately, there, there's an email. And now looking forward, what, what are we going to do in 2024? So my my first order of business is to invite you to a research symposium. We we will have two of these. The, this is a, a two-hour virtual meeting where we will have breakout rooms. We will not have souvenirs, novelties, or party tricks, but plenty of interesting things to talk about to start the process of figuring out what's important for research for us. We are starting with what our sister committees in, in TRB have come, um, you know, have developed. Uh, we're also distributing a survey. There'll be a link in, in the in the following slide um, so that we're hoping you fill out by March 21st. What we want now is to just get the idea with a working title and a few sentences about what it is. Um, and we want that by March 21st. So in April 11th, that's the working date we have. It may change slightly, but we would like to invite you all to that. Um, our subcommittee subcommittee chairs will be guiding the, the breakout uh, sessions, and we hope to identify things that we want to uh, push further. And then a second one where we will actually um, we want to have teams of people that are drafting them over the summer so that we can get them done in time. Uh, I want to give a, a kudos to, I'm stealing all this process from William because it has worked really well under his leadership and um, and we want to just make sure that we can continue that momentum. Uh, in September or in, in sometime late summer or early fall, we will be prioritizing them and then submitting them for October 31st and hopefully we can feed that pipeline. This field is not, this this challenge of uh, performance management is not going away. In fact, it is broadening. So I expect that there is a lot that we can focus our attention on and then we, we have to pick the best for that. Okay, um, so look for an invite for April 11th and I hope you can make some time. Um, it, these have been well attended in the past and we wanna have as broad reach as possible to have the best uh, research needs come forward. And in the next slide, there should be, uh, yeah, the the, the, uh, the the survey monkey that we're hoping to get out to you. And uh, well, it, it is already live, so you can I think you can already answer it. There is a QR code if you're so inclined. Um, and, and we hope um, to see you on April 11th. And that's my update. Thank you, Edgardo. Any questions for Edgardo before we move on to Gary and the Subcommittee on Organizational Management? Please put them in the chat. So, all right. Um, Gary uh, chairs the Subcommittee on Organizational Management together with uh, uh, Jihan El Said of West Virginia DOT and David Potts of Iowa DOT. Gary, all yours. Uh, Christos, thank you. Uh, and uh, thank you for everybody that has uh, provided us with. Uh, some feedback on some of the information that uh, we've been sending out recently. Uh, our subcommittee is uh, focused on organizational management, those pieces of performance management uh, that relate to how an organization is structured and functions, uh, including things like uh, uh, innovation and improvement. Uh, recently, we've been focusing on, on working with our colleagues at, uh, uh, at Transportation Research Board in similar subcommittees on the very exciting uh, release of the uh, Transportation Moonshot Project uh, efforts. Uh, working to see what we can get in terms of uh, webinars and information into our uh, uh, TPM newsletters. And we are continuing to work down uh, in, in that capacity and to continue the exciting work that uh, has, you know, was started many years ago uh, for the activity, or I'm sorry, the agency uh, capability building portal uh, that uh, is coming to fruition. We believe that actually will be a great uh, uh, supplement to many things, including uh, the, the transportation moonshot project. Uh, so uh, we are 
uh, continuing down those paths. And uh, we encourage uh, anybody online that if you know folks in your organization uh, at your DOT that are in, uh, interested in those uh, elements, uh, let me know or let uh, David or Jahan know. Uh, we are uh, experiencing some, some exper uh, exciting times uh, related to all of that. Uh, all right, uh, Christos, that's the quick update uh, and back to you. Thank you, Gary. Um, and moving along again, you know, please uh, put any questions that you have in the chat. Uh, we're going to move with the task force on emerging uh, performance area that is being co-chaired by Diana Belden of Minnesota DOT and Kelly Travel B from Michigan DOT. Yeah, hi, Diana. Here again, I'm going to leave the update today. And so, next slide. So this is, get, we might not need the background and purpose very much longer here. Everyone is really aware that, that transportation agency goals and objectives are, are moving to be more holistic and focus on broader society goals and values. And so that's why the task force was formed to look at how this is affecting things and how we might recommend measures and um, to move these things forward. So our initial areas of interest there are listed, but we decided to consider focusing on, next slide, for the next 12 to 18 months to look at ACE, accessibility, climate, and equity. But we had a meeting and discussed it and decided that for now to move forward, just focusing on equity and affordability as our membership was small enough that it didn't, it wasn't going to be sustainable to break into three working groups at this time. So at our last meeting in our well, actually, we had our last meeting just yesterday, but our February meeting, we did a nice debrief from, from the TRB annual meeting. And some of these, my three kind of favorite quotes was, you know, noticing this changing, this shift and framing, centering on a thriving society and how the transportation system supports this and that it's really feels like a true paradigm shift. Another comment that community transportation, center transportation was everywhere in the TRB zeitgeist, love that word, um, though people st are still trying to figure out what it means for our work. So this is um, important stuff that we keep working on. Then uh, that there was a lot of research and buzz about the transportation connection to land use. I find this to be a very welcome development because we've been, we've realized the connection for a long time, but as transportation professionals have often, have often been saying, well, we don't control land use, but it's time that we coordinate, you know, so that we can help make things happen. So our discussion continued yesterday. Uh, we want to determine what our actions should be. One of the things that we noted at TRB was so many very good agency examples that are new and innovative, you know, looking at these emerging areas. So we're talking about if we would do a showcase of good practices, probably on our our um on the ER, this TPM portal under our task force. So we're going to look toward that. And we also generated quite a few research ideas. And so we'll be coming back to that next month in advance of the research um, symposium. We want to also be sure to support Astro's strategic emphasis on safety as it relates to equity. So next slide. Okay, this one actually then was already gone over by, by Edgardo. We just like to remind uh, folks that our task force submitted this one for fiscal 24 that was funded and we're waiting to, for it to be contracted and, um, or actually, actually I get confused. We're waiting for one to be contracted from the year prior. This one, uh, we've selected the contractor and now it'll probably be another year before it's contracted given the huge delays. And then the two that were submitted from our working or our task force that we're hoping to get funded. And then one that we we're considering for an implementation project about effective resilience performance management. Next slide. Okay, here we are, please join us. And I think people heard the call because we had 19 people yesterday and that was a record and I'm just so thrilled that people are interested. So really love the engagement and uh, we will carry on. So please join us next month, the first Wednesday of the month from two to 3 p.m. Eastern time. And if you do show up by joining the link that you can get either from here or on our um, our portal page, we'll get you on the mailing list so that you're sure not to miss anything. Thanks. Thank you, Diana, and thank you, Kelly. Uh, next on is uh, Daniela Brema, who's uh, chairing the subcommittee on system mobility and emerging technologies. Uh, Daniela. 
Okay. Right. I actually have a question for Edgardo, which I will follow up later, but how are we dealing with these huge delays in getting these projects contracted, the funded and the GPO picked, because we have some delay in, uh, to such a yeah. scale that it might change the topic itself. So anyway, this is something we yeah. probably all share. We all yeah, share. Let me yeah. just take that, uh, Daniela. So we heard from um, Victoria Sheehan, at TRB, and they are uh, really working hard to get over this um, hiccup that um, mm -hmm. a, a generational transition plus the pandemic and all kinds of things have, and also uh, harmonizing TRB with within the uh, national academies. And they are working very hard to overcome this. They're confident that we won't, this won't be a ongoing issue. Um, and we should see the fruits of their labor during this year. Okay, sounds good, yeah. I think it's very important. I get to the point where people are questioning the scope of the project because it's been such a long time since this was um, developed. So I don't know how we're gonna deal with that down the road, but that probably is the next step to talk about. All right, let's talk about this mobile emerging technology. So uh, first of all, I wanna say, you know, we have had some really great engagement from our members over the past years. Um, off and on we, you know, I, I, um, I think we also, Deanna says, yeah, we had 11 people, we excited or 19. If we have less than 20, I'm like, what happened with everybody, right? And so uh, um, sometimes the expectation of these groups um, shifts over time, but we have some really good engagement from folks from different parts of the agencies, and that's always been appreciated. I think attracting the, the right people to the right committees <clears throat> can be a challenge sometimes because there's only so few people dealing with technology. Um, and the technology folks and those DOTs, there's maybe one, two people that do that. And um, and then it's really hard for them to figure out what, where they're going to engage. So that's that's an ongoing problem. That's not going away for us, but that's something we've been sort of challenged with. How do we make it worth their while? So we had a um, we had a lot of sort of momentum around the COVID years with um, providing sort of timely information. We kind of been able to pivot a lot as the SMET committee was broad in scope, we were able to pivot a lot and pick up things that nobody else was dealing with or need to be dealt with in time. And so but in COVID years, we talked about the availability of travel data and availability of private sector data and data to plug in the questions that the various organizations and governance structures had about where people were moving and how, how traffic flow was, um, uh, was uh, being respective of the various restrictions from COVID. And so that was an, it was interesting because we really, um, start to appreciate the value of data. And that was really important, I think. And we continue to build on that momentum. Most recently, the conversation really are moving now around machine learning and artificial intelligence conversations. What are the applications, performance analysis? How do we, how do we better understand data that's available to um, assess performance of our strategies that we are deploying? Um, using machine learning and artificial intelligence uh, where it's being applied. You know, I know the asset management groups are uh, more heavily engaged in the uh, ML side of things, but this this discussion is kind of getting broader and there's a lot of interest. So there's a couple in situ projects going right now. They are probably going to be finished this year on uh, the use of machine learning and artificial intelligence as state DOT. So hopefully this, these two items of research will come out soon and help at least illustrate also, again, by the time they come out, they're dated by a couple of years, but illustrate what DOTs are doing. There's a huge need for information exchange on this topic. People always want to say, what are you doing? How are you deploying? What kind of um, data source do you have? So that's been sort of a focus recently. It seems to be emerging as a focus. And again, it's also uh, where is this being discussed? What other committees are doing this? Um, so it seems, again, to be pivoting to, to pick some of this up. Uh, we did complete a strategic learning process. I mentioned that during my last update, uh, which provides us some information and potential research, but not as much as we hope for. Um, so there will be some additional work needed to identify research needs going forward out of that work and the work that is now emerging, especially with the uh, AI ML discussion. Um, so we're looking at uh, refocusing the work scope and plan for SMET. 
So there's a, a request to potentially moving from a joint subcommittee to a single standing committee model, um, instead of being under two um, standing committees being just housed under one standing committee that's still kind of evolving and not totally figured out yet. Um, we, do, uh, we do recognize there is a lot of overlap and that will continue. Uh, we'll continue need to recognize the need for coordination between the standing committees. Actually, there's three standing committees that deal with this topic. So there's this uh, performance-based management, the, um, uh, the analytics committee, and then the uh, standing committee for, for a, a, a transition system operation. So all three committees have elements, also not fully engaged in the topic itself, but they all have elements. And so we're trying to figure out how to best navigate that and how best um, coordinate that need. Uh, so that's acknowledged and it will not go away, but um, trying to make the organization a little easier. Um, uh, we have a lot of conversation performance evaluation needs for our congestion operation technology deployments. Um, we just had a big, um, uh, um, uh, there's a big discussion on, on developing maybe some synthesis projects or some uh, research projects on this to see what states have deployed, what technologies, what have to learn from it. We seem to keep hitting the hurdle of um, data proprietary issues and agreements that the state sign with the third party providers or the, uh, um, the OEMs or whoever is providing that particular technology service. That makes it really hard um, to document and publish and talk about the performance results on the system. So that continues to be a challenge. I'm um, sure how we easily overcome this challenge, but there is more of a call for that. Uh, we actually, uh, there's, a, um, there's a, um, a conference coming up in, in July on uh, automation and there's a lot of um, interest in developing a workshop around this um, from the federal side. So that is interesting because the feds would be probably the best to enforce that, especially if federal money is used like grant money or discretionary money um, for deployments. But again, it's a difficult topic, but very much an interest. Um, and then discussion about merging with other work groups that deal with AV, CAV, CAT, and all these uh, technology related topics. Again, uh, how is that best done? How, how are we going to do that without, you know, um, so we're still meeting the needs of our DOTs in this area. So a lot of um, discussions to be had and, and challenges to be figured out. That's where we are right now. Thank you, Daniela. And um, again, any questions, please put them in the chat. And we're going to be moving from Daniela to um, our risk management uh, uh, subcommittee, which is chaired by Nathan Lee and um, William Johnson, and vice chaired by with Monica Almond Smoot from Texas and uh, Patrick Howley uh, serving as uh, the secretary for the subcommittee. Yeah, just quickly, also want to recognize Anna. She's naturally our Ashton liaison, and Daniel Federa with FHWA. Uh, I pasted the link to both the ERM portal as well as our subcommittee page and the website there. Uh, we sort of lurk within the ERM portal. I think that Patrick and I, uh, or Ryan Bailey uh, <laughs> and I are gonna tag team on this. So I'll, I'll hand it over to Patrick. So um, my link wasn't working. So in a, a fit of, uh... Just trying to find something. I used my coworker's link, and so I'm sure I, I caused him to not be able to to get in. Uh, so today I'm Ryan Bailey. So if I say anything misstep, we can blame it on him. Uh, no, this first part, and I'm glad William you put the link in there. One of the focus areas that we've uh, had within the the subcommittee is to make the web resource. Uh, or, or the website, more of a resource to, to those that are interested in the material that want to get to know more and, and join the community. So the first couple of uh, the first few slides that we have kind of talk about what you could expect to find on there. And in the first one, um, we've updated each one of these except the membership um, a tab. We're, we're still working on that a little bit, but really want to focus in on you know, we've identified who those leaders are. So if you have specific questions, the purpose statement, what we're trying to achieve, uh, the meetings and events are up to date and have 
any of the associated documents uh, tied to those. And is uh, the one I'm most excited about is this resource um, page, which has been updated or the tab. If you don't mind going to the next slide. Specifically in our subcommittee meetings, which we, we meet each uh, second Monday of every even month at 1 p.m. Eastern, um, we have started having brief presentations by states that are attending to just give us an idea of what their program is like. And so they've been kind enough, uh, California and Minnesota, over the past few meetings to provide uh, materials and you know documents that they've been using so that we can learn and grow from one another. And there may be some ideas that we can implement um, or that we can uh, look at new policies or, or something of that nature to help make risk management more robust in our areas. Uh, we, we also cover um, things like uh, William and Nate were at uh, TRB this year and the AJE special section subcommittee on risk management, like what sort of things are happening there and how we might uh, like the asset management group is work more hand in hand with what TRB uh, is trying to do. Um, William was kind enough to add a research roadmap um, and how that specifically relates to risk management with all of the different research that's going on um, in the different areas, how, how that addresses risk as well. Uh, and, and so we, we've had some pretty productive meetings as of late. I hope to get up to that 19 number. Uh, Deanna, I think that would be fantastic. So if, you, if any of you would like to join us, we would love, love, love to have you. And the last item that I'll cover in, on the next slide is the Committee on um, uh, CTSSR, Transportation System Security and Resilience, had really pushed uh, supporting the Resilience Improvement Plan, uh, you know, support and communication and everything. And now that those are coming into uh, being published and, um, and finalized in each state, uh, they've backed off a little bit about how much they, they talk about it, but we do have a place on the site where we can continue to um, post communication, but also the resilience improvement plans themselves um, from each of the states. And so our subcommittee will be kind of taking that torch, moving forward, gathering that information and, and help to disseminate it um, to the other states. And as far as I know, um, four and a half, maybe five and a half states have their RIP uh, approved by FHWA. I wanted to put in a, a plug here um, for the, the next TPM webinar, which is on March 20th at uh, two o'clock Eastern. We were featured in that webinar and we have a couple of states talking about their RIP. Uh, Nevada, Delaware, Maryland, they're not necessarily going over the RIP in totality. They're covering specific pieces of their RIP. So I think it'll it'll be great to hear from people who have gone through this process and uh, have got it approved or have submitted it. Additionally, Monica will be going over the risk COP, uh, and that's the community of practice that we have for risk management. And last, also included within that webinar, uh, Jack, Jack Branholm with MnDOT will be talking about performance measures uh, in context of enterprise risk management. Uh, one other thing to add besides uh, the task force is April 8th will be our next meeting and that link I sent you, you can access how to get registered for that. And some of you should have received an invitation for the ASHTO 2332, that's the big risk management manual, uh, NCHRP project. Um, that is the task force introduction meeting. So that'll be kicked off this month here in uh, the, the prime led by, you know, one of our a common face, Amy Flannery, who will, will be leading that activity. So the task force is, it, we're saying it's set, but I think there's still some flexibility. If you wanna know more about it, just feel free to contact me directly. And I think that ends it. Thank you. Pass it over to asset management. Yep. 
Thank you, uh, William. Um, and last, uh, we have uh, Matt Hoprick from Iowa DOT wrapping us up on uh, with the update on subcommittee on asset management. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I'll be relatively brief here. Um, first of all, just a reminder that you can connect uh, with us and find information about us at the TAM portal, tam-portal.com. Um, also a link I put in the chat. Um, and there you'll you'll find um, all kinds of resources around asset management, including a calendar of events that uh, will uh, take you to the TAM webinar series. Our next upcoming uh, webinar will be on April 17th. Uh, I skipped over the second bullet there, which is our monthly meetings. Um, I should use the term monthly sort of loosely because we actually haven't had one since November, but uh, for, for various good reasons, including uh, holidays and so forth as the uh, the date uh, that that we typically meet being the third Monday of the month has, has uh, fallen on a holiday a couple of times uh, during that uh, stint. So in any case, uh, we are uh, uh, will be meeting on March 18th and looking forward to seeing uh, the asset management uh, pra practitioner community uh, there. So please join us. Uh, we are also working on advocating for an asset management conference in 2025. Um, TRB has, uh, in the past, has uh, um, uh, organized an asset management conference uh, approximately every two years going back. Actually, I think we just completed the, the 14th national conference last summer um, in Boston. And uh, uh, so the next one would be coming up in 2025. Uh, it does not appear that TRB will be uh, organizing that conference. So we're looking into various options for how we can bring um, uh, together a conference. Uh, it's been a very popular event. Uh, prior to the pandemic, we had over 400 uh, people participating and uh, in uh, 2023, it was it was over 300 and, and had um, a fairly good uh, turnout and a lot of great content presented over three days. And I think it's a great opportunity to get our asset management practitioners together we are seeing a huge amount of turnover in the asset management community. Um, new people uh, coming in and working on asset management, not only at state DOTs, but but uh, also uh, at, not only at the federal level, but uh, also uh, state and local agencies, transit agencies. And so it's it's a great opportunity to meet face to face and, and um, kind of help build our community because uh, in, in a lot of um, agencies, there are, there are not that many people who are kind of focused on asset management. And so having the opportunity to come together, learn from each other, share things that work um, or some things that don't work um, uh, can, can be very, very valuable. We have a few um, work plan items uh, as uh, we've been kind of working on in addition to, to what I mentioned above uh, the ongoing activities. Um, we are, um, Mike Johnson has been leading a team that's been working on evaluating the annual consistency review and really looking for commonalities among the agencies, uh, the 52 DOTs have to submit that or required to submit that documentation uh, every year. Um, and looking at uh, those documents, it's clear that uh, there's a wide variety of kind of how states are are documenting their consistency. And so the idea here is to kind of look for what are those common uh, touch points? What are some things that we might want to um, potentially as AASHTO come together and maybe either um, share or recommend um, in terms of uh, practices or just uh, kind of raise awareness of various ways to kind of approach some of the issues around doc documentation or demonstrating the consistency of implementing the asset management plan. We're also working on help, helping to develop a resource guide. One of the things about um, the asset management community is we've been extraordinarily uh, successful in getting uh, research funded. We have a, ton of, a, a, a large number of resources that have been developed to support asset management activities. And I think, you know, as I mentioned earlier, especially for people who are kind of coming new to the asset management community, having uh, so many resources can sometimes be overwhelming. There are, are so many research reports uh, tools, uh, other resources that are available that it's it's sort of difficult to to know exactly where to start. And so the idea of the resource guide is to kind of just serve as a roadmap to all those resources and help people navigate it and identify where uh, they can get the information and resources and help that are going to be uh, helpful to them and also how they can contribute to the community and support uh, ongoing efforts uh, to, to uh, develop asset management um, resources. And then uh, the the last thing that the, on the work plan is our stamp review rubric, really thinking about how we might want to um, 
uh, evaluate asset management plans um, as we kind of look look at them objectively and provide some feedback uh, or, or a, a, some kind of a, a rubric to be able to evaluate an asset management plan and, and look for ways that we could um, could recommend either improvements or identify promising practices that that are uh, being um, uh, put forward in those plans. Uh, this is not necessarily to do that process, but more to develop kind of what would that framework look like for that review. So those are some of the work plan items that we have um, and uh, appreciate uh, this audience here today. Uh, if you're in asset management, uh, practitioner or involved in the asset management activities. Thank you for being involved. If you're not, please make sure to pass along this information to those in your agency who are working on asset management so that they can kind of connect with our community and become involved um, and uh, um, learn and share what are things that are happening in your agency or the agencies you work with. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Are we planning any webinars or anything on consistency reviews and so forth in the future out of the asset management uh, subcommittee? That's a great question. Um, we have recently been talking about the upcoming webinar uh, timeframes, and I would have to say that uh, uh, you're catching me cold and I don't remember exactly what we have kind of agreed to, to the, to the upcoming ones. I don't know if if uh, anyone else on the call, uh, Kiana's here or something. That's okay. Else. We don't. So we can always circle back, but that's yeah. you know a great opportunity you know to look at what we could do in the future, right? Um, you know, and um, you know, and bring something forward. So um, thank you again to Matt. I don't see any questions in the chat. I've gone through them. A lot of good comments. A lot of great links in the chat. Um, and uh, a lot of that discussion that takes that has taken place, you know, will be part of what um, you know Lori will be uh, including um, on that uh, web portal. So since we don't have anything, um, actually, I'm going to skip the discussion part because there was no questions there, uh, and I'm going to turn it um, over to Karen to recap our action items that out of the meeting today. Great. Can you hear me? Uh, yes. Great. So um, if you're not getting regular emails from Anna, I put a, a note in the chat. Please let her know. And she would love to add you to the CPBM email group. Um, it's a great way to stay connected. And I also put a link to the Federal Highway TPM frequently asked questions out there. If you go to the TPM website, it's kind of my one-stop shop for Federal Highway. There's a um, sign up there also, and you can get um, you can stay tuned for all this good information coming out. Um, so for the action items today, we encourage encourage each each state DOT to post comments to the Federal Register by next Tuesday, March twelfth. Um, I just shared with all of my MPOs this morning since I got the draft Ashto letter, and then with a couple other people that asked for to see that as well. So we've got 52 state DOTs and 4,132 MPOs. We want everyone to post a comment. Put a save the date for September 17th through 20th to join us in St. Louis for the conference on data management and analytics, planning and performance management. And yes, I asked why, we, why our name was last. I'm on the planning committee and we were first last year so or last time, so now we're last. Last but mighty, um, if you have not signed up for the technical services program ASHTO offers, there's a TPM one specific, trans um, so contact her to get more information. Um, there was a link in the chat as well as in the PowerPoint to fill out the research survey by March 21st. Research statements um, are highly critical to further the, the work, and we've been awarded millions and millions of dollars thanks to your involvement. So Edgardo also asked you to talk to your research contact and encourage them to vote for like five out of five for the three research needs statements and the one synthesis topic that the Committee on Performance-Based Management submitted last year and then put a save the date on the April 11th to May 23rd research um, workshops that Edgardo 
indicated were coming out soon, which is why I told you to contact Anna if you're not getting them. There's tons of great resources, training webinars, et cetera, out on the TPM or the TAM portal. And the best thing that you could do is pick a subcommittee work group or task force and just say, I want to attend your meeting and attend a few meetings and go, nope, that's not the group for me. Attend another meeting. Um, if you could, if you could have ever, someone from your DOT involved in one of the subcommittee work group and task force, I promise, I promise that you would, you would get more out of it than what you put into it. So did I miss anything? And that we will get back to them on whether on the next uh, uh, webinars for asset management after we have a chance for Matt and Mike to look into them. Thank you, Karen. Um, and thank you again to all of our speakers and to all of the attendees for today. Uh, please make sure to check out the TPM portal for all your performance management resources, including the notes and materials from this meeting today. Um, please watch your emails for the upcoming spring edition of the TPM newsletter. And uh, as William shared earlier, um, please join us uh, and register for the March 20th TPM webinar number 21. That's what kept confusing me. I would have shown up on March 21st instead of March 20th. So it's March 20th. Um, our vice chair for the Committee on Performance-Based Management will be moderating um, that, um, you know, that webinar. So, it, uh, um, you know, Jean will be uh, uh, in charge of the webinar and it's gonna be about the, interse the, the intersection of risk, resilience and performance management. Uh, great lineup as uh, William shared earlier. Uh, a huge thanks to everyone for being here today. Uh, really great thank you to Spypop Pandrens and Rory Richter for their support. Uh, to um, Mish uh, for their partnership and to Anna for always being there when we've been needing, here, needing her. So um, thank you everyone.